Um, in some ways, I drew the short straw uh, this week in talking about Jefferson. Um, I think of all the major founders, uh, the, the one whose poll ratings are plummeting, falling the fastest would be Thomas Jefferson. And this is for a lot of reasons, but I think the most important one has to do with the issue of slavery. That this man who wrote more movingly about human liberty than probably any of the other founders uh, is guilty of hypocrisy uh, in terms of uh, enslaving uh, people on his plantation at Monticello. Uh, and, and not just being a slaveholder, because several founders were slaveholders, but not evolving in any way on the issue like people like uh, Benjamin Franklin or George Washington did. Uh, if anything, Jefferson actually uh, became worse. Uh, but putting all that aside, and I actually don't want to put it totally aside, but thinking about that in terms of other things that Jefferson did, um, I think it's fair to, to say that he might have been the most influential figure of the 19th century, or at least certainly the first half of the 19th century. Um, after that, I think he'd have to contest with Frederick Douglass, Abraham Lincoln, uh, John Marshall, who we'll be hearing about on, on Friday. I guess, I guess Marshall would give him a run for the, the first half of the 19th century. And part of that influence that, that you know, Jefferson had left us really with our, our modern political system and our, our way of organizing politics through parties. Uh, one way I think about this with my students is that, you know, Alexander Hamilton, I think, won the big argument, the big debate about America's economy. But I think in many respects, Jefferson won that, the debate about politics and what American politics was going to look like. And so I'll, I'll be uh, intersecting with many of the star standards, but the, the big one, which we can't miss, is History 5C explain the origin and development of American political parties. So that's my charge and I'm sticking to it. Here we go. So, oh, I gotta learn how to change these slides here. Okay, so because, because Jefferson doesn't have his own musical, I thought it was only fair to give him, you know, a few acts here in this talk. Uh, the musical Hamilton has just two acts, but today Jefferson gets three acts and a prologue, maybe more than he deserves. And I want to start out here talking about the premise that the founders had in coming into creating the American government. Uh, and, and they really shared a common thinking in, you know, in the late 18th century that political factions and political parties uh, were counterproductive, that they weren't helpful to the body politic. And they violated you know, one of the most important principles that the founders had. And we talked a little bit about this on Monday that term disinterested. This is a term that the founders use commonly. And today when we use that word, we usually mean that people aren't interested, that they don't care. But what they meant was that uh, people were committed to the common good. Uh, the opposite of disinterested is self-interested. And that was the worst thing you could be in the early American Republic. And so if we think about the education of Thomas Jefferson, uh, he came to you know, share this, this common belief. Um, he was actually, I think, had maybe the best education that uh, someone could get uh, in, this, in this period. Uh, he had uh, uh, what we would call elementary and middle school learning uh, from a local parson, uh, intensive study of, of the classics of Latin uh, and, and Greek, uh, was something that he kept for the rest of his life. Uh, he attended the College of William and Mary uh, he stayed on to continue to read in law uh, with George Wythe, uh, one of the great legal thinkers in, in early America. And, and in terms of parties, this wasn't just an American idea. British subjects in England were also frustrated with parties in the 18th century. And there were two main parties, the Whigs and the Tories. And even though the, you know, those parties had some important differences, in some ways it didn't matter what really mattered is who was in power. And so there was another way to refer to parties in England at the time, and that was the court party or the country party. The court party was always the party in charge, whether that was the Whigs or the Tories. The country party was the party out of power. And the country party usually criticized, you know, the, me the mechanisms of government and the ways of patronage and just the way that the court party behaved. Um, and, and, and in some ways, you know, this kind of echoes uh, 
some things in our current day politics. You might have heard of this term, uh, Republicans in name only, that the Republican Party might, you know, and we could use the Democrats as an example too, you might have certain principles, but when they come into power, you know, they change and they become rhinos. Uh, well, this would happen in the 18th century as well, but it was even worse because if you were a Whig in name only, just figure out that acronym. Yes, they were the winos. Uh, and so someone who, who shared this critique with Jefferson and others was none other than King George III. He tried to rule without parties and we see how that ended up, not very well. And so one theme of this talk is that parties uh, do have a certain utility and usefulness. It's hard to live without them. Uh, incidentally, real quick tangent, Jefferson and George III share something else. Uh, they contributed their libraries to create their national libraries. Uh, the foundation of the British Library is King George III's library, and the foundation of the Library of Congress today is actually Jefferson's library, which he, I guess, didn't exactly donate. He, he sold at a pretty decent price to the US government after the British had burned down uh, buildings in the Capitol in, in the War of 1812. So Jefferson was uh, you know, most famous in his time, and I guess uh, today as well, as the author of the Declaration of Independence. He wasn't known as the author right away, uh, but when he saw how much people embraced the document, he certainly, you know, this is, he certainly had leaks. <laughs> he was the, the lead author uh, from the committee in the Second Continental Congress. Uh, and we can just take his most famous line. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In that one line, he combines all kinds of different systems of thought. Uh, you have the natural rights theories of John Locke, you have the English opposition tradition, uh, the, you have the Scottish common sense or moral sense tradition and that line self-evident. Uh, that's something that Franklin uh, contributed uh, to, the, to the declaration. Um, and you have the sort of universalist ideas of the French enlightenment. And so, in writing this document, Jefferson was really bringing together all the ideas that were in the air at the time. Uh, it's, a, it's a work of genius, but it's not necessarily inventive genius. It's more of a, a genius of, of synthesis. Uh, one thing that we don't see in the Declaration, or in the Constitution for that matter, is parties. And I think this is a really important point, especially when it comes to the Constitution. And it goes back to what I mentioned before about this idea of being disinterested and self-interested. And we have some insight into this, uh, into the process of making the declaration uh, from this digital scan that came out of the Library of Congress a few years ago. Um, I've mentioned this in some other talks at Humanities Texas, so some of you might have heard this before. Uh, the preservation, preservationists at the Library of Congress uh, did this digital scan and they found out that while writing the declaration, Jefferson made a mistake. Uh, throughout the document, he refers to the American people as our fellow citizens. But he tripped up while he was doing this. And at the very bottom, you can see our fellow subjects. Uh, Jefferson had been a subject his whole life. Uh, that's what people who you know, were part of the British Empire, they weren't citizens, they were subjects, subjects to the crown. Well, you can see he, he fixed his mistakes, uh, a little bit of blotchy, but it was okay at the end. The, the cover-up uh, worked all the way until the 21st century. Um, but the important point here is the idea of citizens. Citizens um, in the 18th century definition, um, and, I, and really you know, today as well, but I think it's really true back in the founding of the country, citizens were supposed to be completely committed to the republic. Uh, they were supposed to be selfless. Uh, they were supposed to serve when called, whether that was on a jury or on a political body or in the militia or in the army. Uh, and, and so again, this didn't leave room for the idea of political faction or parties. So we're gonna fast forward to the creation of the new American government um, under the constitution and see how this premise, this idea of, of no parties uh, really disappeared uh, once, they, once they started uh, exchanging ideas and realizing that they, they weren't all the same. Uh, we saw this image with Lindsay on Monday, and I, I love this image of Washington's first cabinet because you can't imagine a group of guys less likely to have a rap battle uh, than this 
than this crew right here. And I think one thing that's important in creating his cabinet is that Washington didn't strive for ideological balance because again, everybody was supposed to be on the same team. They were supposed to have the same ideology. Although he did strive for a certain amount of geographical balance. You have Alexander Hamilton uh, from the Mid-Atlantic. Uh, you had Henry Knox, the first Secretary of War from New England. Um, and you had uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, and Edmund Randolph, uh, of course, from, from Virginia, first Attorney General and, and Jefferson, the first Secretary of State. Interesting, you see that uh, someone is not there. Uh, John Adams, the first Vice President, wasn't part of Washington's cabinet. Uh, they weren't particularly close, and nobody quite knew what to do with this office of the vice president, what it really meant. Um, and as, as president of the Senate, uh, some people thought that the vice president was actually part of the legislative branch, not the executive branch. Um, so in this cabinet, Alexander Hamilton, who we heard about yesterday from Kate Brown, really emerged as the most powerful figure. As the Hamilton musical uh, song goes, it's, you know, it's nice to have Washington on your side. Um, and I don't think this was inevitable. I think it just turned out that in creating this early American financial system, uh, you know, it, Hamilton and Washington just happened to agree with each other. Uh, to Jefferson's great dismay, uh, Jefferson actually wrote that, uh, this is later in the 1790s when things got very heated, we'll talk about in a little bit, but Jefferson wrote in his diary something that was called the Annus, and he was paraphrasing somebody else, but he agreed with this, that if there was a civil war, Washington would side with the North. Um, so he really saw his position in the cabinet uh, being a minority opinion over time. And as we heard yesterday, you know, uh, Hamilton had this uh, complex uh, four-part economic program that involved creating the national debt, the national bank, uh, you need taxes in order to pay down uh, the interest on any debt. So you got to have, you got to have that, you have to have revenue. And then finally, his plan for ma manufacturing. And together, this is really kind of the roots of America's capitalist system. And this is a system that we have a lot, uh, a lot of issues with today. And there's a lot of problems, but I think it's important to remember that this was an idealistic system when Hamilton created it. And it was really in opposition to the the old world and the older way of thinking that really set, celebrated landed wealth. And, and that's what Jefferson was all about, right? As a planter in Virginia, he was someone who celebrated agriculture and not manufacturing. Uh, he criticized the idea that people would earn wages. Um, he thought that that was a condition uh, akin to slavery. Um, and, and this is where part of the hypocrisy comes that, you know, he, he would criticize wage labor as being slave-like while actually enslaving um, people. But that was, that was an important part of the ideology um, of, of the time. And so this, you know, these big ideological differences led to the clash uh, that created the first political parties. And, and Jefferson, uh, along with James Madison, created the Democratic Republican Party to oppose Hamilton's program. Uh, Hamilton's uh, party really kept the old title of Federalist, which was first used by the, um, by the people that supported the ratification of, of the Constitution. Um, so um, we're gonna get into kind of the steps of how that, you know, that party formation developed. And I wanna use the musical Hamilton, the room where it happens to illustrate it, because I think it helps to show, you know, how reluctant they were to create parties, because the first part in Hamilton's plan, which we learned about yesterday, the debt, uh, was actually a subject of compromise between Hamilton and Jefferson and Madison. And it's illustrated very well um, in, in the song, the room where it happens. And so in the process, I think we can grade uh, Lynn Manuel Miranda as a historian, and see see if he would see if he would uh, graduate uh, from from Founders Fest in Humanities, Texas. So, in the song and the musical, like so much else, it's narrated by Aaron Burr, uh, and you know Burr is frustrated that he can't be in the room where it happens, where 
you know, decisions are made and where power is wielded. And the it in this case is the Compromise of 1790, the deal whereby uh, Madison and Jefferson accept uh, the, the, the accumulation of state debts uh, into one you know, national debt uh, in exchange for the seat of government moving uh, from New York and then Philadelphia to the banks of the Potomac, what would become Washington, D.C. And so Burr explains all of this in the opening, and, and, and here's where you get the dramatic reading of Hamilton. Uh, he says, two Virginians and an immigrant walk into a room, diametrically opposed, foes. They emerge with a compromise, having opened up doors that were previously closed. The immigrant emerges with unprecedented financial power, a system he can shape however he wants. The Virginians emerge with the nation's capital. And I think uh, one reason historians might criticize uh, Hamilton, the musical, is that Miranda is able to you know, put out all these ideas so briefly, so economically, uh, where it would take you know, a 200 page book for a historian to say something similar. So that, that sets the stage. Um, we also, in the musical, get to see Jefferson and Madison as they go into the negotiation. And Madison says, maybe we can solve one problem with another and win a victory for the Southerners. In other words, Jefferson says, oh ho, Madison, a quid, a quid pro quo. Jefferson, I suppose. Madison asks, wouldn't you like to work a little closer to home? And Jefferson says, actually, I would. Madison says, well, I propose the Potomac. And Jefferson, and you pro you'll provide him with the votes? We'll see how it goes. And Jefferson says, let's go. And then the dinner actually happens. And it's brilliant because as an audience member, you don't see the, the dinner because that's the room where it happens. Only the participants actually know. Um, we hear the chorus, the room where it happened. No one really knows how the game is played, the art of the trade, how the sausage gets made. We just assume that it happens, but no one else is in the room where it happens. So after the, the negotiation that we, we don't see, uh, we see Burr and Hamilton really have a, a recap of what took place. And Burr asks, what did they say to get you to sell New York City down the river? Uh, Hamilton doesn't say anything. And so Burr asks another question. Did Washington know about the dinner? Was there presidential pressure to deliver? Still no response. And then the tone changes and Burr asks, or did you know even then it doesn't matter where you put the U.S. Capitol? Hamilton agrees and says, because we'll have the banks. We're in the same spot. Burr recognizes you got more than you gave. And Hamilton says, and I wanted what I got. And so, and so this is the, the you know, synopsis of this, of this song. Uh, and in the song, Hamilton really wins the day, as he does throughout the, the musical. And so one thing I want to do is to actually test this and to look at you know, the formation of, of, you know, these differences between the two sides and how they came about. And so uh, the actual events in June of 1790 uh, began outside of this building. Uh, we had the question about, you know, who owned uh, the early executive mansions and they're really almost rented out um, from private citizens. And this is the second presidential residence in New York City and it's where Jefferson and Hamilton ran into each other on the street, just outside of the, of, of the doors of the, of the residence. And I've included this, uh, a link to this document that I'm gonna share right now um, in my materials. And, and it's Jefferson's account of how this came, came about. And so he's gonna talk about running into Hamilton. He says, going to the president's one day, I met Hamilton as I approached the door his look was somber, haggard, and dejected beyond description. Even his dress uncouth and neglected. He asked to speak with me. We stood in the street near the door. He opened the, the subject of the assumption of the state debts, the necessity of it in the general fiscal arrangements, and its indispensable necessity toward a preservation of the union. And he goes on to, you know, Hamilton goes on to talk about how his plan was stuck in Congress. They, no one was supporting it. So Jefferson explains further, he says, on considering the situation of things, I thought the first step towards some conciliation of views 
would be to bring Mr. Madison and Colonel Hamilton to a friendly discussion on the subject. I immediately wrote to each one to come and dine with me the next day, mentioning that we should be alone in the room where it happens. Okay, so that last part's not in the primary document, but that's, that's what he meant. And so today, this is the spot where that mansion stood. It's uh, like, I think, almost all historical sites on the lower part of uh, Manhattan. And it's a multi-office, uh, a multi-purpose office building today, uh, not the original structure, but at least they have a plaque. And so Jefferson invited everyone to come to his apartment. His apartment was at 57 Maiden Lane. Uh, this is that spot today. Again, not the original building, but at least they mark where Jefferson lived. And so these were the three principles that went into, um, went into that room. Um, I think it's important to point out that we now are almost certain that there would have been enslaved uh, uh, servants there, uh, at least one or two that would have been, you know, the room where supposedly there was no one else. Um, and, 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 and so they weren't completely um, alone. Um, but it was a private meeting and it was something that, you know, I think it showed how small the country was that they could work out such a large issue in this kind of negotiation. Uh, and so you can read more of the document that I shared and Jefferson talks about the deal that was made, but it really was that swap that Madison would get the votes for Hamilton and the House of Representatives for the debt in exchange for the, you know, moving the, um, the seat of government uh, southward. Now it's important not to just trust one source for anything and so other sources come out of this. Jefferson writes to other people, he tells Monroe about the negotiation, uh, the word gets out to members of Congress uh, in, in New York. Um, the New Yorkers are upset. Uh, the people that are really happy were the people in Pennsylvania because the seat of government was going to move for 10 years while they built this new magical city uh, where there wasn't much um, on the banks of the Potomac. And the people in Pennsylvania thought, uh, well, this will never happen. Uh, we'll certainly have the capital um, forever. Um, and, so, um, and so that was kind of the, the, the situation. And, and as I said, um, in the musical, uh, Hamilton, you know, feels like he really, you know, did well in this, in this trade-off. And I guess the question is whether that's actually true I think the best way to answer that is to look at Jefferson's actual writings. And indeed, he considered this the biggest political mistake he'd ever made, because by agreeing to the national debt, it really set in motion uh, Hamilton's full economic program, which Jefferson and Madison were not able to stop. And Jefferson actually wrote to Washington a couple years later. And in the letter, he said that he had been duped by the Secretary of the Treasury and made a fool for forwarding his schemes, not then sufficiently understood by me. And of all the errors of my political life, this has occasioned me the deepest regret. And Jefferson ended by saying uh, that Hamilton had used the deal to change the political complexion of the government of the United States. Uh, and, and so this might be a fun debate to have with students to present this the Compromise of 1790 and ask them who they thought, you know, won because um, there were certain advantages to having the, the, gov the capital in the South. And I think it certainly reinforced uh, the system of slavery that would um, last until the, the Civil War. But um, in terms of, uh, you know, real material differences in terms of policy of the United States, you know, I think Jefferson was absolutely right. His own self-analysis that he had basically allowed this to happen. And, and, and so the Compromise of 1790, I think, about it, I think about it in some ways like the Compromise of 1850. It was kind of the last Band-Aid that was put on the situation uh, before things really uh, split. And, and that's what happened with the formation of parties. They, they you know, come to an agreement on the debt, but nothing else after that. And by the early next year, um, early 1791, when Hamilton pushes through the bank, which we talked about yesterday, um, Jefferson and Madison um, are actually in beginning um, a, a rebellion uh, or a revolt as we have here on the outline um, against the administration of which Jefferson is actually a part of. And, and, and so when we think about these first 
parties, that might not be the, you know, exactly the right term, uh, because they still saw this as, as kind of a bad word, uh, parties. Uh, and, and so uh, political scientists actually have a useful term, and they, they call these first factions proto-parties. Uh, they weren't full-fledged healthy parties because a, a healthy party system, uh, in a healthy party system, uh, one party has to recognize the other party's right to exist. Um, this is a concept known as the loyal opposition. Uh, and we're testing that a bit these days um, in, our, in our own time. Uh, but um, there certainly wasn't a very developed co concept of the loyal opposition in the early American Republic. Um, these proto parties, the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans, were really trying to annihilate um, one another. Um, and so um, newspapers were critical to the early parties. Uh, in fact, newspapers in some ways were the parties. This was the party organization. Uh, the Federalists had a paper called uh, The Gazette of the United States. Uh, this was published by a man named John Fenno. Uh, he modeled it off of the London Gazette in England, which was really the party or the, the government organ at the time. It published different laws, uh, the perspective of the government, and it really frustrated Jefferson to have to read about Hamilton's triumphs in this paper. And so Jefferson wanted a paper of his own. And so he did something quite incredible in early 1791. Um, he hired this uh, good looking gentleman, Philip Furneaux, uh, who is a pretty decent uh, poet uh, and, and writer. Uh, he hired him to work in the State Department as a translator. Uh, for $250 a year. Um, and, and it was a curious thing because Fernot knew French, but he didn't know any other languages. And his real purpose was to create a newspaper to oppose Jefferson's own administration. And that newspaper uh, became the National Gazette. It was published from the fall of 1791 to the fall of 1793. And George Washington hated this newspaper. Uh, he called Furneaux that rascal Furneaux, in part because Furneaux had three copies of the National Gazette delivered to Washington <laughs> every day. Um, and, and, and so this is, you know, again, I think one of the amazing stories of early American history. Um, well, in 1792, James Madison started writing essays in the National Gazette, exploring the idea of a new party. And again, he wasn't depending, defending a party system. He was actually saying when it was so critical uh, you know, to create opposition, to have opposition, that if, if one side was doing things that were destructive to the Republic, you know, just it called upon the, you know, other people to form some kind of opposition. And I have a picture of Mount Vernon here because um, on one occasion, Thomas Jefferson was carrying one of Madison's essays and he dropped it between uh, Alexandria, Virginia and, and Mount Vernon. Um, and Madison was mortified because they were trying to do all of this without Washington knowing. Um, and, and Madison, who you know, famously soft-spoken, soft got really upset at Jefferson. You can kind of feel this through this letter that he wrote to him. He said, the accident mentioned has caused no small anxiety, which would be much, much greater were it not hoped from your waiting to repair it, that a safe train had been laid for the purpose and particularly that the article had been put under seal. So in other words, Jefferson, you should have been more careful <laughs> with, with my essays. Um, well, Washington didn't discover what was happening really until about 1793. So it was about a year or so later and didn't find these, these essays that Jefferson had dropped. Um, eventually the newspaper that becomes the main foundation of this early Democratic Republican Party was called um, the Philadelphia Aurora, the Philadelphia uh, G uh, General Advertiser. And it was actually published by uh, one of Benjamin Franklin's grandsons, uh, Benjamin Franklin Bache. Uh, and, and this paper also drove Washington crazy, uh, calling his administration monarchical um, in, in, different, in different ways. And so this brings us to um, actual first presidential election that, you know, in which these two proto-parties uh, went head to head. 
And it was uh, when um, the Vice President John Adams uh, ran against the former Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson. Um, Adams won the election in 1796. And because we didn't have the 12th Amendment and um, electors and the Electoral College didn't distinguish between president and vice president, whoever came in second became vice president. And so Jefferson had to serve as Adams's vice president for four years. You can imagine that was very uncomfortable. The main issue that dominated the Adams presidency was uh, a naval war against France. Um, again, going back to what we've learned the last few days, there's this global war raging. Uh, the Federalists generally sympathize with the British. Uh, the Democratic Republicans sympathize um, with France. Uh, and, and, and there's a war in 1798 that begins between uh, the United States and France that was um, limited to the Caribbean. It had profound effects on American domestic politics. Um, this was a time of, you know, liter literal fisticuffs uh, in Congress. Uh, there was this famous fight between the Democratic representative, Matthew Lyon. He's the one with the fire tongs uh, going at it against the Federalist, Roger Griswold. And the issue that they were fighting about were the Alien and Sedition Acts, some of the most notorious legislation ever passed um, in Congress. And I'm not going to go into great detail about the Alien and Sedition Acts. Um, we can talk about them in the Q&A, or you can uh, look up uh, more about them. Um, but it basically tried to uh, do a couple things. Silence opposition against the government uh, during this war, and do everything possible to um, detain uh, enemy aliens, in this case, French people, of which there weren't very many in the United States uh, during war. And, and today we see this as, you know, a violation of, of the First Amendment and, and other rights that are guaranteed by the, by the Constitution. Um, now, why it was important for the formation of parties is that the real reason for the Alien and Sedition Acts, I think most historians agree, uh, wasn't necessarily a fear of the French uh, taking over America, but it was to silence the Democratic Republican Party. And so they wanted to um, do a, you know, a handful of things. They, they wanted to limit the, the free speech of Republican newspaper editors. And actually Matthew Lyon, the guy with the tongs, he had his own newspaper. So he was actually jailed along with several other Republican newspaper editors. And they also extended the period to become a citizen of the United States from five years to 14 years. Uh, this mattered because most immigrants voted for the Democratic uh, Republicans at the time. Um, and so one response to this, uh, the Alien and Sedition Acts, was something known, known as the Kentucky and Virginia Resolves. Uh, these were resolutions written secretly by Jefferson and Madison and passed in the Virginia and Kentucky uh, state legislatures, uh, which um, denounced the Alien, Alien and Sedition Acts. Uh, but they also said, uh, the, the resolutions in Kentucky in particular, that um, a state could actually ignore an unconstitutional law by the federal government. Um, and the word that was used is that they, they could nullify it. And so this is the birth of the idea of nullification, which will become very important um, in the years leading up to the Civil War when certain southern states would claim the same right. Um, well, it's important to note that the Kentucky and Virginia resolves didn't uh, actually nullify anything. Uh, that uh, the thing that actually ended the Alien and Sedition Acts was Jefferson getting elected president. Um, and that happened in part because the Federalists really overreached. Um, these laws became unpopular. Um, and at the same time, Alexander Hamilton created an army Again, this was mostly a naval war, but he created an army, a domestic army that was quite large. Um, on paper, it would, would have you know, been about 10,000 men. He got George Washington to be the head of it because he had to be the head of any army. Uh, and there were fears that circulated that what Hamilton was really up to was not fighting the French, but he was preparing for a possible civil war uh, with the Democratic Republicans who had most of their uh, strength in the South. And you know, this sounds like a conspiracy theory, but one person who thought this is what this is what was going on was none other than John Adams. And, and this is one reason that John Adams uh, 
decided to pursue peace with France, even though the war had made him popular, uh, really for the first time in his entire life. And this is a, you know, a key reason why Adams lost the election of 1800, because Hamilton, the most powerful Federalist, arguably, uh, didn't support him. Um, there's a lot of mistakes made with this image, incidentally. You might even see this in textbooks. This is often mistaken as a recruiting poster for the Revolutionary War. Uh, this wasn't used in the Revolutionary War. This was, this was for the quasi-war against France. But you can see even the United States government made this mistake um, using the same image uh, to recruit soldiers um, in World War I, saying, do as our forefathers did in 1776, um, enlist. So I'm going to end here uh, just talking very briefly about what happens when Jefferson becomes president. And we're going to talk more about this in the document uh, session. Um, so Jefferson, um, uh, you know, I think had a transformational presidency. Uh, it really changed the course that the country was going um, under the Federalists in, in a number of ways. Um, and it was an incredibly heated election, uh, you know, and, and rematch between Adams and, and Jefferson. And Jefferson is able to win this time by putting together a, a voting coalition that would actually last into the Jacksonian era, and in some ways even be recreated by uh, Franklin Roosevelt and become, you know, an important part of the New Deal coalition. And that coalition was bringing urban workers and immigrants together with Southern farmers. Um, and, and, and in particular, you know, Southern slaveholders uh, and, and also poor uh, farmers who might not have owned um, slaves. And you might ask, what in the heck did urban workers and Southern farmers have in common? Well, they all hated the bankers. <laughs> they all hated the speculators, those people that were profiting from, uh, you know, the the, the, the bonds, the war bonds, uh, like uh, Kate uh, was talking about yesterday. Now, it looked like Jefferson had won the presidency in the fall of 1800, but in fact, he had actually tied with the person who was really supposed to be, in our, own, in our terms, uh, his running mate, Aaron Burr. They had gotten 73 electoral votes each. Um, and again, because electors didn't distinguish between president and vice president, that's why this problem happen. Well, according to the Constitution, in such a situation, the House of Representatives decides who becomes president. And this is one of the key dramas in the musical Hamilton. You know, Hamilton wasn't in Congress, but he was still the most powerful Federalist. And would he side with his ideological enemy, Thomas Jefferson, or would he side with his personal enemy, uh, Aaron Burr? And he ends up siding with Jefferson because at least Jefferson uh, had principles. Um, and this is something that's actually true. If you go and read the founding documents, they all criticize Burr uh, for being, again, self-interested, for being someone that didn't have any true beliefs. Um, that sadly uh, was one of the contributing factors to the, the duel that took place between Burr and Jeff or, uh, Burr and Hamilton. Uh, and you know, another thing that happened is that Jefferson ended up dropping Burr as his vice president in 1804. So Burr ran for governor of New York. Uh, Hamilton criticized him in the newspaper uh, and that uh, uh, you know, eventually led to the challenge of, of the duel. Um, this was a human tragedy, but it was also a political tragedy for Federalists. Uh, they lost, you know, I think their most important leader, certainly the person that had given them their, their most vibrant ideas. Um, and the Federalists would never win another presidential election, and they would really be you know, stuck as a regional party until the early 1820s. Well, in terms of what Jefferson did, I'm just going to boil it down to a few key things. And, and I think it's useful to go back to that English model. I talked about the court and country parties. And that in England, whoever was in charge was always the court party. Well, Jefferson really turns that on its head. And he shows that the American way is going to be the country party being in power, which isn't supposed to happen. The, the party that you know, criticizes government, 
that, that doesn't like patronage, that you know, doesn't govern in a normal way, um, that's, that's Jeffersonian uh, democracy. That's the, that's the country party. Um, and so I think his you know, key idea is, is that he set a more democratic tone in the United States. Um, ironic because he was such an elitist. Uh, he wanted to completely reduce the debt. Um, that didn't happen because of the Louisiana Purchase, which we'll talk about shortly. Um, incidentally, his political follower, Andrew Jackson, did. The only time in American history the debt was down to zero, that clock in Times Square wound all the way down, was under Andrew Jackson. Uh, Jefferson wanted to expand the nation's borders, expand the opportunity for agriculture, um, and defend slavery. Uh, and in terms of slavery, uh, on the one hand, this is a contradiction with you know, the other democrat democratizing impulses in the country at the time, but uh, people at the time wouldn't have thought about it as a contradiction. Uh, went hand in hand with democracy because uh, part of what democracy was, was, was removing Indians from land and making it possible for, um, for slavery. Uh, that, that's, that's, you know, that was the, the ugly truth about democracy in, in the early um, United States. Um, so um, of all the portraits of Jefferson, I like this one the best because it shows his self-fashioning and his attempt to try to be the common man. It's almost like the Benjamin Franklin portrait um, when he's wearing the, uh, you know, the, the coonskin uh, skin cap uh, in, in France. Um, and so Jefferson's political accomplishment is, is to sell himself this way, to sell himself to northern immigrants and workers and, and poor farmers as being a man of the people. And then so if we look forward to what Jefferson created, um, I like teaching with this image and showing uh, what became of, uh, of the you know, American Republic in the first half of the 19th century. Um, there was widespread participation among those who could participate, uh, up to about 80% in the presidential elections of the 1840s. And so here you see, uh, you know, a typical election. This was in Missouri, but this could be in counties across the United States. You have people that it looks like they drink too much, people that got into fights, uh, people debating, um, people reading newspapers, which were still very important. But it's also, you know, critical what you don't see. Um, you don't see any people of color except for one person, and he happens to be, you know, serving the ale, and you don't see any women. And so this you know, Jeffersonian party democracy uh, was as notable for its, you know, who, it, who it didn't include as for who it did. Uh, well, this um, legacy has really been left unchallenged until the last generation or so. Uh, and part of it is because you know, history is, is written by the winners, I guess. And in Jefferson's case, he wrote uh, the famous inscription on his own tombstone uh, that here was buried Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of Independence and the Statute uh, of, of Virginia for Religious Freedom and the father of the University of, of Virginia. Um, this is kind of like the, uh, this is kind of like the false modest uh, tombstone. He didn't say he'd been President of the United States or Secretary of State or things like that, uh, but he did certainly list notable accomplishments. Um, in Washington, D.C., we have the Jefferson Memorial um, erected in the 1930s, really a pet project of Franklin Roosevelt. It was originally supposed to be a tribute to multiple founders, to lots of founders, but Jefferson, as, as the founder of what became the Democratic Party, uh, was given this spot. And I think just about every word he ever spoke in opposition to slavery is on the walls <laughs> of the Jefferson Memorial. Um, but um, fortunately, we have a counter to this uh, today in Washington. In 2011, across the tidal basin, we have Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, watching over uh, Thomas Jefferson. And I think this is notable in a lot of ways because um, it, it, it's not just that, that King uh, represents a different way than Jefferson, but he, he represents, I think, taking Jefferson's ideas and, and, and making them um, useful and democratic for us today. Um, one of the great things about the American Rev Revolution is the universal language. All men are created equal. Um, well, we know that Jefferson didn't actually mean all people or even all men. 
Um, but people over the time have taken those words, you know, starting in the 19th century, we think about the Seneca Falls Convention of 1848, um, that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. Or the Gettysburg Address, in which Lincoln you know, quotes Jefferson, but he really does mean all men, uh, black and white. And this is the same thing that King did in the civil rights movement, holding up this universal language um, as a mirror to uh, American society, to, to white society, and saying it's time that we finally live up to these ideals. Um, and, and so I think it's possible to take the best part of Jefferson, you might say, to counter the worst side. And I would include parties in that because um, for all of their problems, they have also helped uh, open up the democratic process um, in the country. And so as the moderator of this, of course, I've gone the longest. I'm gonna stop now. Uh, thank you all and get to some questions.